G'day YouTube. Wobbles on a lot here. <clears throat> As you can see, I live in Australia. I live in the forest in Australia. I live in the rural hinterland. And you know what? When people tell me that I am an anachronism, a little encapsulated walking, talking, out of time ism, I don't argue. Why don't I argue? Well, <clears throat> I was born in 1961. My father was born in 1909. He was 52 years when I was born. 52 years old. And I was kind of, sort of, more or less raised with his mindset because I role model on him in the 1960s on the way he thought in the late 1920s and early 1930s because that's when he was a young man. So my father's father, he was born in 1895. And... Uh, he was a, a wheelwright and a woodsman working for a coach builder, which was enough to have him considered to be the family's black sheep because his father was a teacher and a preacher, the first Wesleyan lay preacher in Glen Innes in 1882. So uh, I know a bit about old colonial Australia, to the point where I speak in a mixture of strine, apostrophe, capital S-T-R-I-N-E, and old colonial vernacular. And whereas once upon a time, I used to be a hunting, shooting, fishing, redneck meat eater because that's how I was raised, and because I was in disagreement with a lady, Harry Krishna, for two years I shot all the meat that I ate. Rabbits and kangaroos, pretty much, mainly. And when I couldn't make myself eat the last bowl of kangaroo tail soup from the last alpha male kangaroo that I'd shot at about 250 metres with a Chinese SKS semi-automatic military rifle, purchased surplus because the ammunition was cheap. I became a vegetarian. Now, before I became a vegetarian, I was actually pretty much an agnostic, and before that I'd spent 10 years as a virulent atheist. And before that I'd been a lapsed Presbyterian at Catholic boarding schools. Two Catholic boarding schools. I spent nearly six years at them, a De La Salle College, and a missionaries of the Sacred Heart College. And when you've been punched in the head <clears throat> for not kneeling down in church, even though you're sitting in the back row so there's nobody behind you with their face in your back, when you've been punched in the head for failing to kneel down because Catholics kneel down before their God and Presbyterians don't and you're trying to be loyal to your parental religious beliefs even though you really kind of don't grok any of it. Yeah, that's how I became a virulent atheist for 10 years. The only thing that stopped me from being an atheist was um, five years of nursing. And, you know, like once upon a time... I was wearing a gown and a hat and a mask and gloves and I had to take the census forms around to my patients in the multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infection control unit that I was barrier nursing them in. And uh, I, I filled out these census forms and one of them was my own. And it said, what business is your employee engaged, employer engaged in? And all I could think of to describe the bit, the nature of the business of my employer, Repatriation General Hospital Concord in Sydney, was cure the sick, comfort the dying, raise the dead. 
because as a student nurse, the only condition that I was considered capable of diagnosing and was obliged legally to immediately treat was cardiac arrest. And if we managed to bring somebody back from after their heart had stopped, we had raised the dead. So that was my job description. Cure the sick, comfort the dying, raise the dead. Then, <clears throat> after a couple of years living in the forest, well, actually I was living in the middle of what was shown on a topographic map as a quarry or a gravel pit, you know, like it was a, it was a farmhouse, which uh, was on a failed farm, which had been bought up by the mining company and sold to another mining company, and Alan Bond had spent $10 million diamond drilling the hill, and when he went broke, the mining company leased the grazing rights to the adjoining farmer, who had actually, um, I think he might have bought the place off the brother of the bloke who went broke and sold it to the mining company. But anyway, there I was, living in a five-bedroom farmhouse on 1,500 acres, and the next-door neighbouring sheep farmer was running his sheep on the place, and I was living in the farmhouse. And I could shoot whatever I wanted to on 1,500 acres, so therefore I was able to run that experiment, and I was able to come to the conclusion of that experiment. And after I came to the conclusion of that experiment, a fortnight later, after I stopped eating meat, because I didn't want to kill things, just for the taste and the grease. After I decided to stop killing things, oh, about a fortnight after that, a particular book of God theories sort of fell into my life, and, and I found... A God theory. I found a religion that made sense for me. So, yeah, since about 1987, I've been a faithist. What that means is I have faith that the creator of the universe is not a fuckwit. Any system which can manage to have a tandem wing tailless ornithopter, a.k.a. a butterfly, flutter by for amusement for three to seven days while it lays eggs and then it dies as an ephemeral, that's not, that's not an ignorant, foolish, half-witted creator. That's a creator that really knows how to do shit. And let's just face it, these particular kangaroos, what are we looking at? Um, Kerry the Kung Fu Kangaroo, her footling milk fed, Mrs. Whitetail, her yearling wiener. All of these kangaroos are running around on the same ground that they learned from their mother's pouch. Epigenetics has perfectly fitted these kangaroos to live right here. And some of them have been here for, you know, 25 years and they haven't moved any more than 500 or 1,000 metres from here. And this is the centre of their lives. They are epigenetically fine-tuned, perfectly evolved to live right here. Nobody can come from anywhere else in the world and introduce anything which is better fitted to live here. These kangaroos are not dipped, they're not drenched, they're not crutched, they're not mules, they're not sheared, and they thrive. Next door to me, there's a sheep farmer, and his, his sheep are not protected from parasites, predators, competitors, and disease. They die. If a sheep escapes from the farm, Australia kills the sheep. So here's the thing, here's the problem. We have this Australian who lives in Victoria. He's a Mormon pastor. His YouTube channel is Shadiversity. His name or nickname is Shad. He spent time studying in the excited states of Norte Armed Medicano because, you know, like Mormons have to do the missionary shit thing. And for those of you who don't know much about the Mormon religion, it's a kind of a sort of a semi-Christian religion. They claim to be Christians, but they also claim that Jesus left the Middle East 
and crossed the Atlantic and moved into Middle America and preached to the Indians. And therefore, the Mormons are kind of more or less sort of entitled According to their fundamentalists, not not all of the quote mainstream Mormons agree with this shit now, but you know, apart from the Tabernacle Choir, there are Mormons who still deeply vociferously defend their right to live in polygamous lifestyles. You know, so um, I don't really see why polygamous Mormons like to look down on polygamous Australian Aborigines. You know, <clears throat> once upon a time. Here in Australia, there were like four or five different skin groups in every individual tribe, clan, you know, country group. And if, if you were skin group A and your mother was skin group B, then you were skin group C, your sister was skin group D, and you were only allowed to breed with skin group E. And that kind of stopped inbreeding within Australian society. I'm not aware of the Mormons living poly polygamous lifestyles having any kind of a program to stop that. So they're a little bit like the Jews who are riddled with genetic disease from inbreeding. So here's the thing, you see. I live on top of a weathered basalt dome. And we had a bit of a gold rush here. Oh, I say 120 years ago, 130 years ago. And after the gold had played out at Vegetable Creek and Glen Elgin and Kingsgate, what happened was the pastoralist employed the Chinese shepherds. And the Chinese shepherds had to not only look after the sheep, but ring bark all the trees. And as they ring bark the trees, the country died. And that meant that there was more moisture and there was more grass. So the sheep farmers could run more hard-footed land lice. And what happened then was there was a drought after the sheep flocks had built up. And during the drought, all of the grass underneath, all of the shrubbery, it all dried and cured. And then the sheep farmers decided to burn all the trees. And following that, there was a wet season, and there was a flood, and there was what they called mass wastings. And after the mass wasting, this particular block that I pay the rates on had lost a metre, three feet, of soil in less than two years. And as it lost the soil, the rocks accumulated on the ground, and what we have is a rock block. So this is what the gold rush did to the hills, the surrounding hills. Down there in the valleys, what occurred was every creek was dug up and it was panned and it was sieved and it was cradled and it was sluiced and all the mud from the surrounding floodplain and half the topsoil from the surrounding hills was fed to the river. And what used to be a place where there was a gully with a stream, with crystal clear water, with crayfish, with fish, with waterfowl, with life in abundance, where the average Australian before the sheep and potato brigade showed up, had to spend two hours per person per day in providing all of their food, shelter and clothing. That was all completely destroyed, devastated, turned into a wasteland. Australia was not formed by the gold rush. Australia was deformed by the gold rush. And because I had the absolute temerity to have mentioned the destruction that the gold rush wrought on Australia on Shadowversity, aka Shadowversity's white blindfold constructed of studied ignorance while he was uh, attempting to glorify the destruction of the Australian landscape in the service of the pursuit of uh, ever more profits from digging gold. Therefore, Shadowversity, the hypersensitive dim damn dumb fuck,
has chosen to block me for daring to speak against his personal Europeon, aka landless ignorant peasant from Europe comes fantasy. All I can say is that if a Mormon pastor hasn't got the balls enough to leave my comments undeleted, unblocked on his thread, then he's a piss poor advocate for whatever religion or theology he thinks he's advocating for. Ciao.